Dihoi Bogus were gave Fulcha, could Kaylor and Athela Porik, Lumpsa, Mary and Richardson. Queen Banach the Arnave Porik, Oliver Fad, Div Shud, Igbile in Aaron, August Div Shakoma, a Tallin in Yov, a Hulak Yard gun down. Welcome to the National Gallery of Ireland in the heart of Dublin City. My guest today is Sabina Higgins, actor, political activist, and wife to the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. Sabina, lovely to see you. Nice to be here with you, Marion. You grew up on a farm in Clunrain on the Galway Mayo border. Yes. And I know you're passionate about the environment. And um, have you brought that concern to where you now live in the Phoenix Park? Oh, indeed I do. I, it's, it's really the dominant thing in the world at the moment, isn't it? it sure is. Biodiversity and the danger to the biodiversity by, you know, the climate change. So very, um, very much concerned with it, but it's just a wonderful place to be surrounded by nature in Phoenix Park. So you have all of the, the aspects of biodiversity, you have the, the plants and the animals, and you have the, the, the birds and the snakes and everything else. But um, we, we're, we're really anxious about, we've had an audit, we had a Trinity come and do a year long audit. So they um, did an inventory of all our plants and everything. So we want to restore um, the biodiversity or, and enhance it because there are seed banks and things that have really, they're in there in the ground and we also have a lot of flora. And are you growing your own vegetables? Oh yes, they're, well I, I'm not doing them but I see them and enjoy them and eat them. But we, oh it has all of that, it's, self, it's inorganic, it's kind of certified as an organic um, a garden and it, it, it has all the, you know, the usual uh, vegetables and carrots and parsnips and spinach and, you know, to every, everything, potatoes. But we've actually, that is another part of our, the, it's already been worked on. We've really done huge work this year on opening all the vegetable and other flower gardens to the public as well for, for uh, there'll be extra tours and uh, they've put this beautiful um, gravel in you know what well it's like the 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 water pebbles that kind of but it's, it's beautiful golden and it's transformed the whole thing so it's be a lovely experience now and the COVID is over and people are back because they're very popular I mean already we have tours all the time or, you know we had before the COVID in on Saturdays for the garden and we have tours all the time for the house. So these now will be an extra um, dimension. Lovely. You moved to Dublin from Clunrain when you were 17. Yes. Had you itchy feet or was it all part of a major master plan that you were cooking up? <laughs> well, there was no master plan as such. It's so strange now to see young people and worrying about their leaving cert and what they will do and all of that, you know, at, at school, you just went to school and nobody bothered about what you did after your leaving cert, you know? So we were never concerned uh, with that. So I had no plan, I was just a uh, child of nature, say, of reading and, you know, being at home and all of that, which was wonderful, you know? But, um, there was no ambition at all. And then my, cousin, my cousins, uh, there, was, well, there was a few people around who had gone to Dublin to go into the civil service. And uh, so <laughs> my mother put me in to sit for the exam. And off I went to Dublin and I had my two sisters there already. And that was, it was like St. Patrick's Day. I came up on St. Patrick's Day, so it, and it was my first time ever in Dublin, you know, and I, I hadn't told them I was coming, and I was wanting the adventure that I would find my way myself, but when I came in by Croke Park or the, and saw these rows of houses with these 
uh, fences behind them and closed doors. I was terrified. <laughs> so when I got to Westland Road, West Fear Street was then, I was so thrilled to see my sister Anne running along the platform. I remember still with the red uh, velvety velour coat, which were the fashion at the time with little, a black velvet collar. So that was the big adventure starting in my life, you know? So you got a job in the Land Commission? The Land Commission, yeah. But it wasn't long before you got involved in the world of um, theatre and acting. Well, I was always a prodigious reader and I just loved, as I say, that's what I did with my life. I just end, end, read to a point of, of fault, you know. I loved the all, everything, you know. I don't know how it happened in the country that we had them, but we had um, Oscar Wilde and George Bernard Shaw and Dickens and everything. And I just, and then there was Schoolgirls of One Library and those, but I was reading and I loved, you know, our poetry books at both primary and secondary in both English and Irish were f all nature poems. So they were all talking about the life that was around us, you know. I mean, you know, we say elegy in a country churchyard about the, the, the ploughing and the autumn and the, all, all of the things. So uh, that was kind of all an extension. I was just really a romantic, you know, I really was uh, quite <laughs> un, un, unearthed in one way, but it was, it was just romantic. So that's how I was thinking of Dublin, you know, of, of this imagination of this. So when I got here, that's I wanted to see to continue with reading or something. So I joined the academy for voice production and stagecraft. But I wanted to pursue my great love of um, poetry. I mean, we had just such wonderful, I love the romantics and, uh, you know, Shelley and Byron and Wordsworth and they're still my, I'm still romantic, they're still, you know, I mean, the French Revolution and the romantics and I'm, I'm off. So that was really why I got involved in theatre. And in 1965, Sabina, Deirdre O'Connell, with the members of the Stanislavski Theatre Group, set up the Focus Theatre. And I remember you put on plays by Ibsen, by Chekhov, by Strindberg. Very unusual at the time. We did. We were, we were doing the modern, the best modern classics on both the European and the American stage, because they, they weren't being done in Ireland at the time. You had a lot of the kind of, um, we say the Irish or kind of uh, plays or each one. So this was, these were kind of the, the classics and they were, all, they were so much to do, well they were wonderful and it was great exposure to have to the Russian and the American and the French and all of that theatre and it was uh, very welcomed by uh, a, a lot of people but also they were very relevant and we were really ready, ready for them to come from our um, improvisations of dealing with great social themes you know there were we'll say for for instance in um 1969 that's when we had been there while that you had that whole movement of the students and youth suddenly being coming center stage and needing to be listened to with that and we did an on wheeze and tigany and oh it was it was such a great um wonderful production and a great success but it gave that platform to young people and they you know could identify with this and it, it just showed that young people had things to say anyway it was very great success and that was to do with the youth then on the next the next one i remember oh there's words like that was um we did uh, chekhov's uncle vanya and that's very much Dr. Astrov and that is all about the environment and saving the, the nature and that. And that was one, um, a wonderful production as well. I remember Tom Hickey played Uncle Danny and Mary Elizabeth played uh, Sonia and it was, it, was a, it was a great success. And then the following year, the women's movement had just 
started then, it was, must have been 1970, 71, and we did the Doll's House, the Ibsen's Doll's House. We did a lot of Ibsen. I mean, I, I, I remember I was in Doll's House and I was also in a Hedda Gabler, Ghosts. We did, there was, he, Ibsen was such a, you know, he was, he was so great for all the playwrights around the, the world, you know, for our playwrights, for O'Shawn O'Casey and everyone that Ibsen was, showed the way of having the social themes, like the enemy of the people was completely about the, the environment and the water and about corruption. But anyway, the doll's house was such a great uh, success about Nora leaving her safe where she is being, you know, being kept as this little housewife and being told by her father and by, then by her husband to do, and that she realizes that how she's been treated and it's wonderful speeches in it when she feels betrayed by this and that she decides to make her own way. So we played it for five months to great success. And then we toured with it around the country to, you know, to Kilkenny and Wexford and Cork and Limerick and uh, Galway and Athlone. And in the afternoons, Sunday afternoon, we would do improvisations and they had never seen improvisations done before and it was great to show you can make your own theatre. This was And what was too. the reaction from the established theatre world? Oh well for, for everyone was so delighted was we, we had every Friday night in the uh, was it Saturday night, uh, in the doll's house we had discussions because the women's issues were really on at the time and there was great chauvinism and there was great resistance uh, you know, two women being wanting to be <laughs> recognized <laughs> as equals or whatever. So we had all the really well-known people um, leading, having a panel there and leading discussion and talk, you know, with the audience. So I, I remember, I'm sure she'll forgive me saying it, I remember one night um, a man in the audience shouting up, you wouldn't be up there tonight if there was any man who would have been interested in taking you out. <laughs> so it was, there was that level of resistance to it, but there was also such a welcome uh, for it. So we were really very much a part of the, the, women's, the women's movement. It was during this time that you met Michael D. Higgins. Yes. What was it about him that attracted you to him? Well, just he arrived out of the out of the blue, should we say? Mary, it was to it ties up again with the women's movement. Mary Kenny had just been given for the first time ever there was a women's page in the Irish in the Irish press. So uh, her sister um, um, Ursula was an actor with us. So there was a, a, a Michael. Uh, there was a party thrown at Kenny's house, and Ursula invited us all. So into the party arrived Michael, Michael O'Leary, and Michael Mills, who had been really instrumental in persuading nothing to pay for to have a women's day. So you know, we were, it was a big room, and big. So we were making room for the newcomers. So Michael found his way over to where I, the part of the table I was at, and he shared my chair. So that was really uh, how it started. And of course, then he was, you know, Mary Kenny, if you remember, I mean, you can imagine the conversation and her holding, holding forth with a great big pile of Ferrari Rocher that she had been given. <laughs> but it was a wonderful night. And of course, Ma Michael, I mean, he was such a great, conversation so he waded in and <laughs> there was no way Mary had it all around me. It was wonderful. So I was, I, I, I was really, really impressive. And the, I remember the discussion was something about the, the merits of the uh, individual as opposed to the collective or something. So I was really, really impressed with this and I held his hand <laughs> to encourage him. Yes. But, um, and that was so it? That was, well, that was, that was just the beginning of it. That then arrived, I was playing in the, I think the Dublin Theatre Festival was on at the time and I was playing and a bunch of flowers 
<laughs> arrived at the, at the theater. And then he was working on the, he was uh, with Justin Keating, I think, on, we were going into the, the thing of the programs for going into the European Union, you know, for that. So he was in Dublin a lot. He was lecturing in Galway. So he would be coming up and I would be meeting him. And, and then, of course, it was very exciting um, for us to have somebody with this, this political edge to our conversations and discussions. And the next, the, one of the big things is he arrived at Mrs. Guy's. And like everybody knew Mrs. Guy's restaurant in Baggett Street, the women's movement were meeting upstairs. And the restaurant was in the next floor down, and we went there. We went there in the evening, and then after play, so we went there. And the same, uh, it was great, she was a Scottish woman, Margaret Guy, and a Polish husband. So it's the same menu all the time. And they had two sons who were both devoted to Mao's little red book. <laughs> so this, all this stuff was happening in Guy's. So the menu was always the same. Um, French toast, bacon, and pineapple, uh, Polish scrambled eggs, and the Polish scrambled eggs would have these huge basin-sized mushrooms plucked on top of them, and um, goulash. So you married Michael D. in 1974, Four. and you moved to Galway for well over 30 years. And like your husband, you've always been a political activist all your life. And when I think of you, Sabina, in Galway, you were always out there marching on women's health issues, holistic education, the anti-war movement, but you also had to juggle all of that with, with four young children. Busy, busy. It was, but it was so, I mean, that was wonderful. I was so lucky to have met Michael and to be introduced to politics because really we didn't have any poli politics for, and to, to really, be able to, our concern about social issues and that, to be able to put them into a, a framework, the political um, culture and, you know, what was the spectrum from left to right? We knew, knew nothing really about that, but we knew we were humanitarian and that this was our area. So it was wonderful to, um, you know, to be, I was, to get, after get involved, with, say, with the Labour Party, I was going to the up to Errolsford Terrace where they had their place and we're going to the, the conferences and then the, the um, we seem to be always doing ca um, canvassing, you know. I mean, he stood in 73 and didn't get ele uh, elected but became a senator and then he stood in 74 and got elected to the local one. And after that, it was, we were always involved in, and then we were always campaigning there's always so many, so many um, issues, and there really was, you know, the 70s and the 80s were just, as you, you probably know, all the social issues. I mean, this is what Deirdre came to for now. There was no contraception. You couldn't even get the censorship. You couldn't even get information about family planning. And if you got anything, there was a little... Uh, Veritas, or a little Catholic Truth Society place up in O'Connell Street that was open at, not open at lunchtime, where you could get information on the, the, the I think it was the Billings or the Rhythm Method or whatever it was, because I remember my sister-in-law wanting to, getting on to me to see could I get something and research it and find that is the only place you could get I mean, you can imagine the state of that Ireland that was so patriarchal and you had the Charles McQuaid was there and you had, I mean, the Catholic, you know, well, of course, we, 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 we hadn't even heard of evolution or anything else, you know. So Ireland was a very closed, very, um, uh, very really closed society and it didn't welcome anything new coming on board. I mean, focus wasn't welcomed, you know, the Stanislavski um, system, because it was an establishment. There weren't all what the wonderful stuff there is now, 
where you have so many creative people and you have so many theatres and you have so, so much has happened in the, the last, you know, decades. But at that stage, that wasn't um, there. And um, when we opened Focus, many of the, uh, some of the, now some of J.J. Finnegan and if were good, Alec Reed and the firm, but some didn't come, the critics didn't come at all because we weren't establishment. And I remember Gabriel Fallon, who was a big respected person in the establishment when we opened, saying, are we putting too few eggs into too many baskets? Meaning there isn't room for another theater. It was kind of the arts were for, you know, for a closed elitist community also, that kind of notion. I know you went back to university at the age of 60, and then you ended up back in Dublin 10 years ago. Were you happy to find yourself to be the first woman to the president of Ireland, or was it a total culture shock? Well, it was a great shock, but it was a welcome shock because um, I was so happy. I was so convinced. I suppose we were convinced for years that Michael, as president, would really have this freedom from the party and from, you know, even all the great work he was doing in the clinics and that. You know, we had been through all the campaigns on for Central America and we had through the, um, the anti-war ones. We'd, we'd really been, we were, we were campaigning all the time. So it seemed to me, and he was always the leader. I mean, if you see, pictures of parades coming down um, O'Connell Street. I mean, he was always there, one of the, few, the ones at the banner. So I, his judgment was always so good, even in the educational things when we were in firm. His, his judgment, he always turned out to be right. You know, that his judgment was right, even though it was very unpopular at the time. And he was, you know, we were often shouted at and all, I mean, you know, in the Eighth Amendment, <laughs> we were called murderers and God knows what, you know what I mean? So we'd been through all this and everything had moved on, but I just knew that for it would be just right for him to be and that it would be so good for the country and so good for how things were working out internationally at the time. But I was thrilled at that and I really worked at the the campaign, you know, but I had never thought of myself of it inter having impinging on my life. I had no, I had never given a thought to moving to Dublin, it was just get him elected. But I had no, I find it strange that I know I was, I was quite taken by surprise that suddenly I was here in Dublin and I wasn't to go back home. I had to, I had to go, we went to the inauguration in the morning, which was wonderful, in um, Dublin Castle. And we had, came to, uh, there was a reception in the Auris for a lot of the, you know, political and various people afterwards. But I wasn't going home anymore. I mean, that night there was a reception for everyone in Dublin Castle. And the next thing is we were going up to next, I think up to Derry to, uh, there was a festival for, for um, choirs or something, so that I never got back home. <laughs> and I had no, I mean, the place was deaf just as, as we were. It's still the same. This big office that we had, two offices for, because he had so much constituency work and all his papers, we had had to accommodate them when he left the university. We had to build on an extra piece to the garage. So we walked out, and that's just the same as the day we left it in 2011. Nobody has been in it since, and we haven't been using that space since, which seems, um, it was such a change. But, um, oh, I, I very much, um, I committed during it, and I remember saying it, that, you know, my, my, my main object in it would be to support Michael. I mean... <laughs> I mean, I, I may be, um, you know, 
I think all is too much, but I have actually always had such belief in him, and, and now he's really, that, he's really doing such you know, wonderful work and doing, I loved all our 1916, the centenary um, commemorations, and they really were so wonderful for me to be part of all, all of that, from the, the whole decade of remembrances, from the, the lockout, you know, and the, the place, Liberty Hall, and all, all of Larkin, and then coming on to 1916, and all the families. I mean, that has been a wonderful experience for me, and I have really, because of my experience and focus really, is I think, and then it had helped that I had gone to university, and I had got, um, you know, what they call the language of the thing. I think Wittgenstein says the language of the game. I had much more knowledge of what the different uh, um, spectrum is of, you know, of having a liberal, neoliberal, conservative, neoconservative, a socialist, you know, fascist, all that. Is, and very, very valuable when you're working, you know, and you recognize, you know, where people are at. So I feel it's been, well, it's been a, a second go at life for me. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sabina, your work as a political activist continues. You're a patron of the IFRA campaign, the campaign to end female genital mutilation, a hidden problem for women who come here from African countries. There are 200 million women in the world suffering from the effects of having been cut. Part of their um, female genitalia have been, been cut away, impinging on their whole life and 200 million, and there's 30 million young girls now that are in danger of it happening to them if we can't convince uh, the world. And Ifra, you know, she, she came here to, to Ireland. She was traded, trafficked in really after the, uh, the big conflict in uh, Somalia. And it was only when she was here in a refugee place and examined that they were wondering what was happened to her, you know. And that's when she learned what had happened to her. And then slowly she remembered herself and a group of little girls is happening to them and the terror of it. So she set about learning English, studying, and said she was going to work to bring an end to female genital mutilation. And she's had a lot of, a lot of success, you know, in, and she's in Somalia and, um, and around, you know, there is much more awareness now. And she got great support um, from Maggie O'Kane and um, uh, Samantha and Mary McGuckin made the film. And that has been seen worldwide. So there really is, but it, it, it's just amazing. And it's not just, it's in, I think, 27 countries but it's not just in, in Muslim countries. In some places, there's up to 78 or 98 percent of young girls and infants are gone. But it's also Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox. And it, the Catholic and Protestant are particularly in Kenya and in the Sudan and Mali and all of those. So really what the task is of, um, we have in Ireland, you know, we, we've, you, know, you need the legislation to make it legal, but to do that, to get it, you've got to get for out in the command, you know, her campaign is with the families and the community, and then of persuading the governments, the um, civic society, and the uh, religious leaders, a tree, a thing, to bring an end to it, to bring in the legislation that will make it illegal so people will know. This has nothing to do with religion. It is, what, it is illegal. So that's really what the, the task is at the moment. And of course, you're also very involved, Sabina, with the Breastfeeding Association. Yes, and in Ireland, we're very far behind the curve. I mean, the World Health Organization um, has, they've done all the research and it's widely known that 
the very best start for a baby is for the first six months of its life, it is exclusively breastfed. And then after that, you can go straight on to solids. Now, because of a repressed you know, culture here, Ireland has been very far behind. Places like Sweden would have you know, 90%, Britain would have. But it's really crucial for, you see those formulas, milk for the formula, the alternative. A lot of poorer countries, uh, they're being persuaded and, you know, by corporate interest that this is the best for their child. And they, there are places where they would be using contaminated water to mix with those. I mean, you'll see pictures of people, a baby, tiny baby, being fed with a, a bottle. And just the, it's so cruel. And it's one of the things, you know, of the, the Sustainable Development Goals, five of them had to do with women. And one of them would be to do with the women's, women's in, in, in um, liberation, their, their, their rights, their participation as equals and for not being repressed. They need the emancipation of women. And this is one of the places where it's so easy, it's the very best thing, and to be persuaded, you know, and for, to not know. But there's a lot of help now in, in Ireland. With the, the, they're back doing the um, midwifery, you know, training in it. Like when I breastfed mine, there, was no, there, was only about, there wasn't half a dozen of us. And you couldn't get any information anywhere about it. The doctors didn't want to know. Of course, it should be part of the doctor's medical training that they're able to help people and, uh, you know, recommend it to them. But there's the Quidju, the Lalesh was the one that was there long ago in my time, and the Friends of Breastfeeding. And women in Quidju, they set up when they've breastfed themselves, they go out to other women and they're there. I have a breastfeeding day on the 1st of October. First week in October is International United Nations Breastfeeding Week. So I always have um, 100 breastfeeding women coming for what's called a latch on morning. So they all come and do their breastfeeding and it's lovely. Sabina Higgins, continued success with all of your campaigning work and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's lovely, Marion. Mm -hmm.